This evening on The Rock Newman Show, D.C. Council member Brianna Doe represents Ward 1, which includes Howard University and a historically black community. We'll talk with her about how gentrification is changing the face of that community, get her perspectives on the clash of cultures ramping up between longtime residents and newcomers, and also look at her proposal to promote more affordable housing in Ward 1. All that and more coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University located right here in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. My guest this evening is District of Columbia Ward 1 Council Member Brian Nadeau, a Democrat who joins us to explore a number of critical issues facing her constituents, including the social and economic impacts of rapidly growing gentrification, community relations with police reflected in her Washington Post op-ed calling for an end to stop and frisk. She's also fielding proposals to see more affordable housing made available in Ward 1. We're pleased to welcome Council Member Brian Nadeau to The Rock Newman Show. So, you are an elected steward with fiduciary responsibility for Washington, D.C. That's what you're doing now as, as council member, Brianna Nadeau. Yep. So that's how people see you in the news, see you on TV, shows like this, in the newspaper. But I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to Michigan, sure. where, you were, where you were born. Tell me a little bit about your early, er, your early days and what sort of formed your outlook on life. Sure, thank you. Um, so I grew up oldest of three girls. Um, in a community that wasn't so progressive, but my parents were. Mm -hmm. And so we grew up really active in progressive causes and with candidates. And I worked on my first campaign when I was 11 years old. Let me ask you a question, stop you and ask you a question there. Sure. You grew up as progressive, but not in a progressive community. Oh, correct. So yes. did you feel and see the friction early on as a result of that? Absolutely, um, and it was interesting. So we grew up in a, a largely white community. Um, we're Jewish, so that was also, there weren't a lot of Jews where we were growing up, and mm -hmm. also it was a pretty conservative neighborhood. And so um, I guess that from a young age, I learned to be somewhat of an ambassador of progressive causes mm -hmm. and um, to really be involved. And um, the other really big formative thing from my childhood was being a Girl Scout. I was, I sure you knew was, I was gonna bring that I up, sure right? was going to get into it if you had. Yes. Yeah. Talk to me about being a Girl Scout. Well, I was a Girl Scout for 13 years, which is pretty much as long as they let you do it. Mm -hmm. And um, the two big things that I learned in the Girl Scouts that I still use every day are to look for work and to leave things better than you found them. Mm -hmm. And that's how I do my work on the council. It's how I did my work on the ANC. And it was the mindset that I brought with me when I moved to the District of Columbia um, 17 years ago now. Mm -hmm. so. And so you came here, you uh, went to American University, you got your, got your master's at American. I did. I mm -hmm. came um, after college. Uh, I went to Boston College. Uh -huh. and, uh, I, but I always wanted to live here. In my mind, this was the place that people came to get involved in changing the world. So you say you always wanted to live here. I did. What was it, what was the spark that created your desire to always want to live here? Was there, was there a series of things, general, something specific? I think it was a path that I was always going down. Um, even when I was applying to colleges, I thought, well, maybe I'll end up in D.C. That would be great. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's just this idea that our nation's capital, 
course, at that time, not yet being acquainted with all the neighborhoods and the, you know, the, the real DC. Mm -hmm. But the idea for people from the outside that the nation's capital is a place you can come and, and change the world, yeah. that's something that always inspired me. You know what? I'm hearing something bigger. <laughs> I'm hearing, so you're, you're, you're in your formative years, you're thinking, wow, I wanna end up in DC because that's where you can change the world. Yeah. Do you wanna be president? I don't think so. It sounds like kind of a pain in the butt to me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me press you a little bit. Let me press you a little more on that. One might say being a council member is can be a real pain also. <laughs> it can be, but there's a lot of rewards as well. You know, one of the things about public service and whether it's serving myself as the elected member or when I worked for a member on Capitol Hill is that every day you have the opportunity to wake up and help people. Mm -hmm. And that is always what's inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the nonprofit world when I first moved here right. and um, got my master's at night while I was doing that and thought, well, I need to figure out how I can have an impact in this place that I'm living in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, got involved in the neighborhood watch and the neighborhood cleanup and neighborhood association before I ran for ANC and just really started to understand the issues locally. And I went on to work on Capitol Hill and still had that connection to local politics while I was doing that mm -hmm. as an ANC. And for me, that was really the best of both worlds because I got to sort of be a part of policy in, in that ha impact the whole country, but also mm -hmm. my neighborhood. You know, I looked at uh, some more of your background and you work uh, in public relations mm -hmm. for, for, for a good period of time. Yes. I happen to think a good public relations person can really transfer those skills to a number of sure. other disciplines. What did working in that world of public relations do for you and how has it helped you frame what you do as a council member? So what I loved about working in PR um, was that most of my clients were nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and I got to help uh, people who were doing really good things figure out how to get the message out. Mm -hmm how to talk about what they were doing in a way that people understood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I actually struggle with as a council member, ironically, because I hate talking about myself and what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I like to just talk about how we're all working together and what's getting done. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, so it's, it is, it's a useful skill set in, in the sense that it, it helped me understand how to connect with people on another level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though that's the kind of thing I've been doing all my life, whether it's door to door selling Girl Scout cookies mm -hmm. or um, out in community just getting to know my neighbors. But I think it, it just adds another layer, mm -hmm. I think, when mm -hmm. you have more of a, a professional opportunity to, to, um, to connect with people that mm -hmm. way. So when you ran for council, you encountered some of the rough and tumble of, of politics. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember Bill Clinton saying uh, at some point when Obama was running against his wife Hillary, uh, and I think Obama had some complaint about some criticism, and Bill Clinton said, you know, this is a contact sport. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> <It is. laughs> you ran against longtime council member uh, uh, Jim Graham. I did. And, and DC politics, for the most part, they're re relatively civil when you look at other parts of the country. Sure. Um, but you guys, you know, threw a, threw a few blows. Sure. What did that first experience and sort of understanding, having to come face to face yeah. with politics being a contact sport, what did that teach you? Uh, what did that whole experience teach you? Well, you know, um, also having been on the ANC before I, I ran for council, I had to spend some time doing the work to understand um, how to focus. You mm -hmm. know, when people are throwing, hurling things at you or they're angry, um, just understanding that from the constituent side, um, you know, that's a person in need that's mm -hmm. upset, but it's not really about me, right? Mm -hmm. So that was one thing I had to learn was how to sort of cut through that and say, how can I help this person who's so angry right now? Now, mm -hmm. when it comes to, candidacy and going head to head with an incumbent or another candidate, for me it was just about remaining focused on the goal, which was to ensure we had somebody uh, representing Ward 1 that was really focused on that work. Mm -hmm. um, obviously there, were a, there was a lot of drama in that campaign, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think 
the best way someone described it to me was that I was fighting fire with water. <laughs> and so just trying to remain cool and calm and focused on the things that I came to say. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is good advice for life because mm -hmm. you never know what's going to come at yeah. you. Okay. So um, your desire for public service, uh, your campaign, obviously, you got, you, you won. So let's talk about uh, Council Member Brianna Doe's priorities. Mm -hmm. um, if you would rate or rank your top three, four priorities sure. as a council member. Housing, education, and then neighborhood development. Mm -hmm. And um, when I say that, I mean, you know, supporting our small businesses and ensuring that we have all the resources we need in community. Yeah. So it didn't surprise me at all uh, doing, doing a little research that housing came out you know, was was your first one, yeah. and there has been an emphasis that you have a place that you have placed on affordable housing. Yeah. So, if you could share with with me and the and the viewing audience here, what was it that instigated your interest in being so focused on affordable housing sure. for the District of Columbia? When I first ran for council, I knocked on thousands of doors and had conversations with people on their doorstep about the issues that they cared about most. Mm -hmm. Even people who were not directly in need of affordable housing raised it as an issue, which I think is a beautiful thing in mm -hmm. Ward 1. Mm -hmm. We have a whole range of income levels, but if you poll people, which I have, as yeah. you can imagine, sure. um, <laughs> the top two issues they always say are affordable housing and education, mm -hmm. or education and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's because the need is so great. And it, it wasn't a surprise to me because, mm. of course, it's a conversation that's been going on a long time in the District of Columbia. Mm. But I'm really glad that I now have the opportunity to do something about mm. it because mm. it is something that so many people raised as an issue to me. So I'm going to ask you to do this. If, if there is a desperate need, and it certainly appears to be, for affordable housing, mm -hmm. that means enough affordable housing, not hardly enough affordable housing, is there. Yeah. So one can point to whatever those dynamics are, but to a certain extent of past administrations, past council members and the rest, a failure to do that. Mm -hmm. What has been the mistake they have made and how are you as a council member remedying those mistakes? So I think of it a little differently, which is that we now have a better understanding of the full need and that now is the time more than ever to be pushing for radical implementation of affordable housing programs. Tell me what that means. Tell, okay. me what, tell me what that means. So, for example, the Housing Production Trust Fund itself has existed for decades, mm -hmm. but it was only starting, you know, five, maybe ten years ago that it was funded. Mm -hmm. In fact, really not even ten years ago. And only in recent years that it was funded at $100 million a year. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to give credit to Mayor Bowser for moving that money out the door. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the only tool we have. And I think sometimes we get really comfortable saying, well, we've got the, uh, the Housing Production Trust Fund. Right. We're doing a great job, right? right? Uh -huh. But we need to be doing more. So we're in the middle of um, our comprehensive planning process right now. Mm -hmm. And that document has got, that's the blueprint for the whole city, we, right? We, we being the entire council. Well, the entire city. So mm -hmm. the mayor, the council, okay. the office of planning, the mm -hmm. ANCs, and the public. Mm -hmm. And that document is an opportunity to reflect the fact that we all believe there should be more affordable housing and that it should be everywhere in the city. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can look at parts of the city right now and very clearly see you've got, you know, single family homes on huge lots that, you know, could, we could have more housing in that area. And so the other thing that we often um, sort of hide behind is the Height Act, you know, mm -hmm. how it doesn't allow us to build sure. higher than a certain height. Right. But the truth is that even with the Height Act in place, we could double the amount of housing that we have in the city right now. Mm -hmm. We just need the courage to do it. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, the, the focus that I've had has been on housing that's for people at the lowest income levels, but the truth is that we need more housing for all income levels, mm -hmm. because right now you have people who are living housing, in housing that is less than what they could afford, mm -hmm. that could be available to someone who can only afford that amount. And mm -hmm. we just need to build mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. we need mm -hmm. to build it mm -hmm everywhere uh, and we need to really push back when we have neighborhoods say mm -hmm. not here. Mm -hmm. 
I want to, since you said that, I'm going to kind of jump ahead of what I normally would have done. But there's a recent article in the Washington Post about yep. Cedric Gardens. Yep. And, man, that was a, I don't know if you want to call that an alarming article, but it was certainly illuminating. Sure. Of the issue that, that, that the city is facing. Mm -hmm. You have longtime residents mm -hmm. of Cedric, Cedric Gardens mm -hmm. who were complaining, and plenty of people say had legitimate complaints mm -hmm. about, hey, I've been here and I've been paying this money all this time, and now you move folks in here uh, who are on government assistance and they're tearing the place up, they're making too much noise, they're not you know, used to being able to live up here on Connecticut Avenue, and those folks who are going in there are calling those people who are already in there elitist and mean and the rest. Yeah. How do it's we a lot to unpack. How do how do we unpack and reconcile yeah. all of that? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, so you're right. You're talking about a property in Cleveland Park um, that um, in recent years has welcomed voucher holders. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the affordable affordable housing crisis, building new housing is one thing. Yeah. Preserving affordable housing is another, mm -hmm. and then investing local dollars in subsidy. Mm -hmm. is another piece of it because that's housing that exists mm -hmm. that we can subsidize that people can move into immediately. Mm -hmm. And one of the points of that article um, is that we are a housing first jurisdiction, which mm -hmm. means we believe that housing should be the primary intervention to homelessness because that in and of itself provides stability that can help us solve the other issues going on with so, 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 so let me let me take a fraction of this. Sure. So a, f a family is homeless. Mm -hmm. There are, there, are, there are funds and vouchers mm -hmm. to help them not be homeless anymore. There are. Not enough. Okay. But to the extent that there is, how does that homeless family, that's someone watching in here right mm -hmm. now, how does that homeless family go from being homeless through use of government sources mm -hmm. to find themselves a home? What do they do? Okay, and let me say for those who aren't as familiar that there are sort of two tracks here. You've got families and you've got individuals. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we're talking about at Sedgwick Gardens is individuals so we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. With families, um, typically we're helping them find a house or a townhome or a multi-bedroom multi, -un a multi -bedroom unit. Um, and families who are homeless typically come through the Vir Virginia Williams Family Resource Center. Mm -hmm. Um, the mother of former mayor Anthony that's Williams. That's right. Yes, a force of, named uh, for her advocacy. Absolute yes. force of nature. Yes, yes. named for her advocacy. Um, and so they uh, come and they share their situation. Um, sometimes, uh, if it's a family that we think we can help stabilize where they are through some subsidy or counseling, we do that because. Mm -hmm. Prevention of homelessness is the first priority. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have uh, about half of the short-term family shelters that replaced DC General open. Mm -hmm. So some families could get placed in those, and, and that's um, an apartment-like setting. They don't have a full kitchen, but they're really beautiful spaces mm -hmm. where you live in community while we're working to find your housing solution, your permanent housing solution. Mm -hmm. Some families are still placed in hotels. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of things that could happen um, if it's determined that you need shelter. And so, you know, that's a really traumatic experience yeah. for any family, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, some families come to us after they've been sleeping in a car or they've mm -hmm. been couch surfing or they've mm -hmm. been living with a relative and it's a, yeah. maybe not a great relationship and they're yeah. just trying to end up, you know, somewhere safe for the night. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really difficult situation. So, so those, and those people who you help get housing mm -hmm. through vouchers mm -hmm. and other measures, mm -hmm. What do they have a period of time to say, okay, we are assisting you for 90 days mm -hmm. or 120 days or whatever yeah. it is, and then they have to sort of fend for themselves? How does that work? Well, I would say this is something that we still have not perfected. Um, mm -hmm. Ideally, they have some assistance looking for housing, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of the challenge is it's very hard to find housing out there with a voucher. One of the things that this administration um, has done is really work with landlords, and this is actually a perfect segue back to Sedgwick Gardens, mm -hmm. work with landlords to identify properties where they are 
really open to accepting tenants with vouchers, even though legally everybody has to. Mm -hmm. um, but really we'll say, okay, we have a certain number of units available, please send your voucher holders because we want to help be a part of the solution. Sure. Um, and that's actually been key to placing individuals in particular because um, it's very difficult out there, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have a solid credit history, um, which most folks who've been living on the street do not. Yeah, yeah. Y you know, we understand here <laughs> at this show mm -hmm. the, 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 the dramatic need for affordable housing. So I'm gonna stay on this just a little bit sure. longer. great. And in hopes that it will give an opportunity for my viewing audience to understand what it is that a council member does, part of what a council member does. Mm -hmm. Let's stay, so, so let's, let's stay with this um, affordable housing for a moment. Sure. I want to talk about Park Norton. Uh, Park, Mo Park Morton. Mor yep. Park Morton. Mm -hmm. um, that's affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been started by past administrations. Mm -hmm. You came in, you had done a little work before you got into office, mm -hmm. but once you got into office, you really seemed to uh, put your head down, your ears back, and to try to move this forward. Yeah. So talk to me about the dynamics of what you as a council member did, sure. because a lot of folks who are watching are like, well, what do they even do? They don't think you guys work. So <laughs> talk yeah. to me about the I work understand. that was required yeah. to get that move from concept to reality. So we're about in the middle of that reality right now, I can tell you. So Park Morton is public housing um, just off of Georgia Avenue on Park and Morton. Mm -hmm. Um, it is part of the new communities program um, and <coughs> the concept of that program and the promise that we've made to the people living at Park Morton or the people who have gone away and um, are eligible to come back mm -hmm. is that we will build them beautiful new housing, that we will build it in a location slightly off site so they don't have to move if they don't want to mm -hmm. um, and that, that those who do leave get to return. The right to return is a huge piece of this. Mm -hmm. But the idea is you want to keep the community members together because people living in, in a building or a property together really do build a support network, right? Mm -hmm. You have grandparents and grandchildren and neighbors looking after kiddos, mm -hmm. um, and this is family housing. Right. So the, uh, the, the project has been promised for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. Some of these residents have long gone at this point. Um, stage one, um, phase one of the project was the avenue, which is just down the road. Um, there's about 37, I believe, units there that are part of the Park Morton redevelopment. Mm -hmm. But the 37 real units currently occupied. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. So it's a beautiful new building, and in within the building there are 37, I believe that's the number, um, mm -hmm. uh, units occupied by former Park Morton residents. Mm -hmm. But in order to fully replace the property, which starts with 174 units, yeah. we have to build somewhere that has more room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the original contract's been let go. Um, back in 2014, the Housing Authority rebid it. Mm -hmm. That was when I started getting involved before I was elected, but mm -hmm. still, you know, engaged on the scene. Yeah. Um, and the team that was awarded it worked with the city to identify what we call the build first site. Mm -hmm. That's the old Bruce Monroe School. Mm -hmm. So now that's down Georgia Avenue between Irving and Columbia. Yeah. Okay. It is a huge site because it used to be a school. Mm -hmm. Right now it's being used as a park and a garden. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's all done, between the park, the Bruce Monroe site and the old Park Morton site, we're mm. going to have something like 542 units mm. of housing. Mm -hmm. um, a third of them will be Park Morton replacement. Mm -hmm. A third of them will be what we call workforce housing, which is mm. for people making about $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And a third of it will be market rate housing, mm -hmm. which helps subsidize the rest. Mm. And there'll be a park. Uh, where where the existing park is mm -hmm. and some more green space on the old Park Morton site. Mm -hmm. And you as council member Nadeau, tell me about your interaction. How do you help move that forward? Oh yeah. Who do you connect with? Who do you punch? Who do you control? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to hit people. All right. Um, although sometimes I'd like to, let's be honest. <laughs> so um, Here's the dynamic, mm -hmm. and this is what we really want to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. This community dynamic. Now, Ward 1, you know, is the most diverse ward in the District of Correct. Columbia. Georgia Avenue itself is the part of the ward that has been least touched by gentrification, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you more about how I'm going to help with that. Okay. But um, Park Morton is right there in the corridor, and um, so when we said we were going to go, 
build on the Bruce Monroe site, yeah. we got opposition from some loud, not a lot of people, but a loud group. Mm -hmm. Now the way these community meetings work is the people who show up are the people who are upset, yeah. right? The people yeah. who are happy are, yeah. they're like, this is cool, it's happening, yeah. I'm yeah. staying home. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And we went door to door talking to neighbors about the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, I went door to door, the mayor's team went door to door, the mm -hmm. developer went door to door mm -hmm. to really talk to people about what an opportunity is for our neighborhood, and I live in Parkview, mm -hmm. um, to uh, finally fulfill the commitment to the people of Park Morton, mm -hmm. to build even more affordable housing, and to welcome other residents who can pay market rate in the corridor. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten widespread support. The advisory neighborhood commissions, both 1A and 1B, have supported time and time again every hiccup in the project. Mm -hmm. um, but pushback from some of the neighbors on the perimeter about the massing, because it's a big, tall building that's yeah. going to go there, which I yeah. would argue is appropriate for Georgia Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, losing parts of the park. Um, you know, there's a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. But um, Unfortunately, what it led to was three neighbors suing us, and now the whole project is stuck in court. Mm. So we're holding up housing not only for uh, the 147 units we've still got to build for Park Morton, but all the people that would be moving into these other units to, to total 542 mm. families. There's going to be a senior building. Yeah. There's going to be home ownership opportunities. We're working right now to try to create a co-op option mm -hmm. for the Park Morton residents so mm -hmm. they can build equity. Mm -hmm. if this is probably the most important thing I'll ever do as council member. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, we want to make sure that's properly recorded. Put an ex exclamation point because you said it on the Brock Newman show. Yes, sir. Um, so you brought up the G word. Gentrification? Oh, G. The, the G word. The G word. I, actually, that's what I usually call it. No, <laughs> I think when I've interviewed Tony Williams mm -hmm. and Marion Barry, and Sharon Pratt Kelly and Muriel Bowser, we talk about that word. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that word and sort of what what is the what is the fuel that goes in the tank that makes a municipality to be able to to run, to flourish, to do bigger and better things. Yeah. And that's developing a larger tax base. Yeah. You know, higher income, uh, more taxes being paid, more taxes being paid, you're able to do more things. That's on the one hand, that's the good. The bad is these fo uh, the, the folks who gentrify, who typically come in, generally replaced by definition, uh, gentrification, gentrification by definition, is some communities uh, that have been longstanding and people in those communities being changed, being moved out and the rest. So right. you lose sort of the soul and the culture of what these communities have been about and there is inherent friction. Yeah. Yeah. I, got, I see it every day. You got a magic you, you got a magic wand and oh, it's gonna fix no. all that. I don't have a magic wand for anything. Let me tell you how much easier this job would be. Yeah. Um but I can tell you how I try to address it. I want that's what we want to know. So you know, one of the things that I always encourage people to do when they move to a new neighborhood is to get to know the history and the people that mm -hmm. came there before. Mm -hmm. Because one of the challenges we do have is that some people move into a neighborhood with the impression that everything began the day that they walked in. <laughs> and I, I, I'm trying not to be rude, but that mm -hmm. is sort of sometimes the impression that you get. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's difficult and yeah. challenging yeah. because then I end up being the educator, mm -hmm. right? I, and, which is fine, mm -hmm. um, but you know, mm -hmm. I think that role as educator and historian yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, convener is one mm -hmm. of the most important roles I have. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you're trying to explain some big picture thing, people sometimes say, well, you know, I don't want any political rhetoric. I want yeah. answers, you yeah. know, yeah, sure. and um, in that voice. Um, <laughs> and um, in that voice, in that and voice stronger. yeah. And stronger. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's really tough because I'm the kind of person that wants to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to tweet something and that's going to be the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, fact, maybe you don't want to be president. <laughs> I do oh. not want to be president. <laughs> um, so, but, but that's a start, right? Mm -hmm. The start is get to know your neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. Don't 
just call the police when you see someone sitting on a stoop that you might feel uncomfortable around, right? Mm -hmm. That stoop's been there longer than you have. Yeah. The people sitting on it probably have too, mm -hmm. which isn't to say, mm -hmm. right, if there's a crime being committed, you don't call the police. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, let's get to know the big picture. So that person that you're talking about, don't call the police, mm -hmm. by and large, mm -hmm. by and large, mm -hmm. that's white folks. By, yeah, by yeah, and large. Yeah, by and large, not exclusively, not but exclusively, I would say but the majority. Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that's, that's white folks. Yeah. So how have white folks responded to you trying to teach them yeah. how to behave coming in these new communities? So there are some folks who are open-minded and appreciate it. And mm -hmm. then there are other folks who I think I was never going to change their mind. Mm -hmm. And they express that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, what I've done as council member is I've tried to be as authentic as I can mm -hmm. and true to myself and what I think people elected me for, which is to do that work, to create that understanding, to really ensure that our policies from the council are not, um, you know, compounding institutional racism, mm -hmm. you know, those really big things. Mm -hmm. And right, how do we really know if the people are following what I'm doing? Well, I did get reelected, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. gives me the comfort and the confidence to know that this mm -hmm. has been the right path. Mm -hmm. You can go out right? there and educate some more. Exactly. <laughs> because, you know, as a first timer, you always get anxious, right? Mm -hmm. Am I, sure. am, is, the, is, this, is this working? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot more work to do, but I do think it is working. And I think there's, there's wonderful people in our community doing grassroots work. Park Morton, for example, we have, um, we have a contractor doing this neighbor up program mm -hmm. where she's out um, and doing these little coffee chats in people's homes yeah. and and people from the public housing and people from the uh, you know private housing are getting together and having mm -hmm. coffee and talking about the things they care about and sharing their stories mm -hmm. if we could do that mm -hmm. in every neighborhood mm -hmm. and I had the budget for that mm -hmm. I would do it in a heartbeat mm -hmm. because okay. that's huge so you talk about Park Morton and that's up by Park Road and mm -hmm. Georgia Avenue mm -hmm. we're gonna come down we're gonna come past the place I call the greatest institution of higher learning in the history of the world and that's Howard University we're gonna pass by them but we're gonna come back but we're gonna pass by them and come on down Georgia Avenue to Florida Avenue, where, 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 which, which starts, uh, once you cross Florida Avenue, you're on 7th Street. Are we going to hear some? And on the side of 7th Street there in Florida <laughs> Avenue, every time that I've come up there for the last 50 years, maybe, I've heard some banging go-go. Some go-go. And, you know, I got happy when I crossed that Florida Avenue. Mm -hmm. And some folks wasn't so happy who had just moved in. I yeah. think some of those ones that you're talking about who you were trying to educate. It's hard. And they made a stink. Yeah, they and did. And they um, prevailed at a point to put pressure on the landlord of the uh, of the building where the guy's been doing this for ever to shut it down. Mm, the community rose up. And you were a part of that effort of rising up to maintain the culture. I saw the letter that you wrote to the T-Mobile person. Mm -hmm. So you got, you, you rolled up your sleeves mm -hmm. and got involved. Mm -hmm. Why did you think that was the right thing and the important thing to do? Well, this was a perfect example of someone moving into the neighborhood and not understanding the history. So I was also on the ANC Fort U Street and one of the things that I really appreciated about the work that I got to do and the people I served with was I got to learn that deep history of music mm -hmm. on U Street mm -hmm. that we don't see much of anymore, right? right? It's all right. but gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're trying to hold on to it, you know, by putting up plaques and murals and, mm -hmm. and but the music itself is almost completely gone. Mm -hmm. And um, this was sort of, a, adding insult to injury to say, now we've got someone moving in who's saying this got to go too. Yeah. Um, now, it's interesting because I have gotten complaints about it over the years, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I always do when I get a complaint is just, let's look into it. Mm -hmm. And DCRA had come out in the past and checked the noise levels because part of it's about the noise levels, not mm -hmm. the music itself. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. be fair. Mm -hmm. um, but they'd always been found in compliance. And I think part of the problem, too, is with more people, let's say, working from home during the day than we've mm -hmm. ever had right. um, and less ambient noise during the day than you have at night, mm -hmm. that sound sort of travels really quickly. Mm -hmm. 
and far. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's sort of like a most basic conflict. We have the same issue up in Columbia Heights yeah. with the yeah. paint can drummer yeah, and, yeah. you know, some of the speechifiers and mm -hmm. it's, Ward 1 is so compact, yeah. you really can't live anywhere without being within earshot of a commercial corridor. Yes, and I was going to ask you because oh, yeah. now we're talking right there yeah. at 7th and Florida Avenue and around the corner is what the old Wonder Bread place where you have the we work the yeah. beautiful we yeah. work spaces do some of the complaints come from there not a one really interestingly enough uh-huh yeah that's surprising yeah because I think it's mostly people working from their houses. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So they might enjoy it. They, uh, yeah. but, but they're so maybe folks they over do, there. or maybe they're so focused on work they don't hear it. I don't know. Yeah. So, okay, let's put the car in reverse and back up. Okay. Uh, no, 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 let's make a U-turn and come back to Howard University. I prefer a U-turn. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Come, come on back. Okay. Um, you represent the ward in which Howard University sits. I do. So I would like to get your feedback on what Howard has meant to the ward, what Howard means to the ward in, in your opinion? Well, having an historically black university in Ward 1 is an honor. Um, and having a leader like Dr. Frederick, who's really trying to revive it and ensure that it has stability for the future is critical. Um, mm -hmm. And now he'll tell you also that they're one of the largest employers in the ward. Mm -hmm. Then I can't forget that, yes, right? Yes, yeah. Um, which is, is good mm -hmm. um, and important. But I also think the presence of the students has meant a lot to the community. Um, and you know, there's some party houses, right? Everyone's gonna complain about students in mm -hmm. every neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean their real contributions, you know, whether they're volunteering or serving on the A and C. Mm -hmm. um, Howard, uh, one of our Howard grads actually served on the A and C and then came, went on to work in my office, mm -hmm. um, which of course is a huge contribution to Ward 1. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just so many things that the university does to enrich the neighborhood too, whether it's through um, incubating small businesses, um, inviting us in when they're holding symposiums and other really wonderful discussions. Mm -hmm. What I'm most excited about is the future, which mm -hmm. is the, um, the work that the university is going to be doing on its properties along Georgia Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, and we always have this tension, um, uh, you know, around affordable housing, right? Sure. Howard sure. needs to develop their sites so that they can remain financially viable, and mm -hmm. I'm always going to keep pushing to do more affordable housing when they're doing that, and they know. Mm -hmm. So. Where, did you, where did you stand on the issue uh, in, with the brouhaha? With the hospital? With the hospital, yes. Man, um, you know, doing what I could to support Howard so that they could get a piece of the pie mm -hmm. um, as we build that new hospital. But also really a complex situation mm -hmm. because there's already, you know, the government had already negotiated a contract mm -hmm. so with, uh, with another operator. So it was complicated, but I think we landed in a good place. And the goal really is to ensure that the med students at Howard have an opportunity to train, mm -hmm. right? So that they can be doctors, so that they can serve. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we are always reminded of in these conversations is important, how mm -hmm. important it is to have um, doctors who are uh, of color, mm -hmm. because people of color often are discriminated against by their doctors when mm -hmm. they seek medication or when mm -hmm. they're being diagnosed with a disease. And that's a huge issue nationally, not just in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. To have more doctors of color, I think, ultimately helps health outcomes for people of color. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a huge driving force. Mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, have this last uh, piece here on affordable housing mm -hmm. before we move to something else. Um, when you say that you know it's exciting what the university is doing with yeah. its, with its assets, and that there is a natural tension, there mm -hmm. becomes a natural tension for your advocacy for affordable housing. Yeah. How do you see that shaping out? What, what, what do you want the university to do um, or to be mindful of that would be consistent yeah. with your vision for affordable housing for this area? Most simply, just build more. Build as much affordable housing as you can possibly afford, mm -hmm. even if the law doesn't require it. And mm -hmm. I say that to everybody, not just the university, because mm -hmm. I think we're all in this together. And you know, the, the people that, uh, the students, the professors, you know, everybody needs affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, the, a beautiful example um, is the project um, now called Trellis House mm -hmm. um, that's over on Barry Place. 
and you know there's a, a good deal of affordable housing there and community benefits came out of that project as well yeah. and that was all part of a planned unit development mm -hmm. um, where you know by law the university was required to engage with the local community and the ANC mm -hmm. to finalize the project mm -hmm. and that was a beautiful outcome mm -hmm. so um, it was a great opportunity to partner. Well, I, I, I like to think the president Frederick probably doesn't do anything else on a Wednesday evening other than to rock, watch the Rock Newman show. So I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure he'll get that message. He'll get the message. You may get a call soon. <laughs> um, I'm always happy to talk to so Dr. Look, Frederick. So look, so as this as this white lady councilwoman. Yes. Here you go again. Here I go again. You, <laughs> you um, write an op-ed piece in the Washington Post, mm -hmm. and you talk about. A lot of stuff, you talk about community policing, the relationship of the community with the police, how, you know, sort of the reciprocal, what should be the reciprocal nature of it. Right. But then, you know, you get, you, you, you get a little bold there mm -hmm. and you challenge what is, in, in your definition, police actions of stopping and frisking. Right. They call it something else, but I thought you very boldly said it's tantamount to, and it is therefore stopping and frisking. Right. What drove you to sort of take that uh, bold stand? Well, you know, I learn on the job. Mm -hmm. And I didn't show up here in the District of Columbia knowing all of this or understanding these issues. I learned from the people that I served yeah. that a lot of the policies we have in place in government, not just this government, but all governments, really have had a deep and lasting negative impact on our communities of color. Mm -hmm. And that is really what moved me to stand up on this. Um, I work together with a number of groups, um, Stop Police, Terror, um, the Ward 1 NEAR Act study group, mm -hmm. um, and constituents um, who are involved with these organizations. And they've really shown me how I can use my leadership and my privilege mm -hmm. to make a difference in these issues. So. And I'll tell you, this is another area where when you have an uptick in violence in Ward 1, which we do right now, mm -hmm. this is a thing that some people who just don't get it will throw in my face. Right. I'm soft on crime, yeah. or um, I don't get it. Now, what's been interesting to me is I feel like all the work I'm doing is sort of building on existing infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. We're not cutting the police force, mm -hmm. right? We're mm -hmm. not doing that. We're, mm -hmm. we're enhancing it. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking, and my point in this op-ed was, look, the NEAR Act, the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act that the council passed years ago yes, now, yeah. that we're trying to implement this mm -hmm. public health approach to public safety, you know, trauma-based care, um, mm -hmm. intervention rather than, than prison, mm -hmm. um, diversion programs, you know, all of these things that haven't been in place. The big piece of the NEAR Act is the data collection. Mm -hmm. And without the data, on stop and frisk that we we have not been getting all the data, mm -hmm. then we can't make informed decisions as a council on how this is being implemented. So yeah. my thing was, if you're not going to give us the data, just stop. Mm -hmm. Just stop altogether. Mm -hmm. and give us the data. We can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because some real data is that now, African Americans comprise 47 percent of the population here, mm -hmm. and are arrested at 83 percent. Yeah. That is. That's oppression. Yeah. That that that's a that's a form of real oppression yeah. that comes out of what has been long term institutional bias and so much else. It's it's when individual bias becomes institutional bias becomes institutional racism. Yeah. Right. And yeah. how do you undo that? Yeah. Well, little by little, but we're trying to do it faster. Yeah. And so. I can tell you that, you know, I wrote that op-ed and yeah. I got pushed back, no, we don't do that, but yeah. how about we ask the people who've experienced and it? And I'll tell you what, we have, uh, we have some footage of you in the council talk, talking about it. Oh this. boy. Yeah, so <laughs> let's take a look. Okay. Chairman, uh, I intend to vote uh, to override the veto today and um, there are a few constituencies that I feel that I, I should explain that vote to. Um, aside from those who have very strongly urged me to vote um, against the veto. There are some who have, ur um, have urged me to vote to uphold it. Um, and so I wanna speak to those constituents who have written in um, and, and reassure them that as Council Member Chase said, um, this doesn't eliminate the civil penalties. Um, and also to our transit workers who I know have come here today to see us 
um, and I want to acknowledge that I see you. Um, and of course, we want to help keep you safe in your jobs and we know how hard you work. Um, but we also don't want to falsely conflate fair evasion with violent crime. And, um, and so I say to you that we will continue working together to ensure that we can uphold your rights as workers to keep you safe as you do the jobs um, every day to keep us um, safe and, and getting to work and, and everywhere we need to go on time. We are slowly dismantling an unfair system and the more we commit to using the lens of race equity in all we do in government, the sooner we will be able to rectify the real crime here, which is perpetuating racist government systems in our own government. So I join my voices uh, with my colleagues today in support of an override of the mayoral veto. Uh, I have consistently supported decriminalizing fare evasion on Metro here in the District of Columbia. Um, and I hope that we can see that happening all across the country in places where that's not yet happened. Um, so I thank my colleagues for their leadership on this um, and especially uh, for those who made it possible to have the meeting today so we could take this vote um, and continue to rectify some of the wrongs that exist here in our community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Member Nundo, um, <laughs> I said on a show, I don't even know if it was this season or before, that racism was America's original sin. Yeah. And for too long, it has continued to be a sin and an open wound that doesn't get healed with status quo thinking. And in that piece there, yeah. you you took the leap, you took the risk to challenge status quo thinking that clearly is not something that a lot of those who are in control of the status quo are comfortable. That's not a conversation they're comfortable oh, yeah. with having. Right. I want to ask you a couple of things. What kind of feedback did you get from that position you took there and where do we go from here? So the thing that I really appreciate is that the major majority of my constituents think that way. They are progressive and they understand that we have to make big changes to right the wrongs of history. That this is the moment. We can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was really a great deal of support for decriminalizing fare evasion, as I believe there was before my time for decriminalizing marijuana use. And I think um, the next is to decriminalize sex work, right? That's the next conversation we're going to Decriminalize sex work. Mm -hmm. How do you define it? Prostitution. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in a moment where I think white people are finally understanding, not all white people, mm -hmm. but white people are finally understanding that our privilege has meant the oppression of others. Mm -hmm. And people become, some people become uncomfortable giving up some of their privilege mm -hmm. to allow that oppression to stop. That's the tricky space in my community. That idea and concept right there. Yeah is as much in my estimation as anything in what got Donald Trump elected president. Oh yeah. People are so worried that they're going to lose something. That advancement for you is a rollback of my advances. You win, I lose. Yeah. Yeah. We don't if have I let you to win. think that mm -hmm. way though, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone can win. Some of us have to give some things up, mm -hmm. but that's only fair. And you're right. I mean, the racism that we're feeling in our communities right now <coughs> has been going on so long and white supremacy itself, mm -hmm. right? So I'm Jewish and um, we talk a lot now in, in, at the council and in community about that root of white supremacy being racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, if you're racist, you're probably also anti-Semitic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the way that black people have been oppressed is just so much more systemic at this stage mm -hmm. in history mm -hmm. um, because of the way it persists. And um, that's something that I just, I feel so passionate about. I mean, you know, my time in office, um, I'm only going to be able to do a little bit of this work, right? I'm not going to be able to solve it because I'm not going to sit in this seat forever. And there's people who are, you know, I'm sure will come behind me that will continue it. And I'm hoping to cultivate that leadership. I think that's part of the job. Mm -hmm. Part of the job is thinking about what's going to happen after you're gone, mm -hmm. you know, not just how long can you stay in the seat. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a perfect example, right, of yeah. how you, you can't hold on to that privilege forever if you're really yeah. thinking about yeah, a just yeah. society. So. Yeah. You have a 19-year-old daughter. 19 months. I'm sorry. 19, 19, <laughs> yes. Boy, I grew her up real fast. You sure did. Now, 19, 19 months. Yes. So what are you teaching her yeah. to make sure peer pressure's rough, she's going to school at some yeah. point, and all the rest, and she's going to be, you know, surrounded by uh, just a myriad of people and, and thoughts. Yeah. What do you teach her so that she can follow in those footsteps, because those footsteps that uh, you are uh, laying, they're important, they're valuable, um, they're critical to moving us yeah. moving forward. So how do you, what do you teach her? What will you be teaching? Well, I love that we live in Parkview, mm -hmm. which is still a diverse neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, we are gentrifiers, mm -hmm. so one of the things that we'll be teaching her is about the neighborhood and what was there before we moved in. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I love hearing about from parents who put their kids in public schools is how much the children learn about others mm -hmm. just by being in a diverse setting in the school. Um, she's going to be in boundary for a bilingual school at, at Bruce Monroe, Bruce Monroe at Parkview. Mm -hmm. um, and they do a really wonderful job there of ensuring that the different parent communities have meaningful ways to connect. Mm -hmm. um, so that the kids also have a meaningful way of connecting. But mm -hmm. we love to take her out on the playground, let her play with other kids. Really just her exposure already at such a young age to people who were different than her mm -hmm. is so much greater than mine ever was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you start. Mm -hmm. um, and when she's old enough, we'll have honest conversations about racism and anti-Semitism and all the isms. Mm -hmm. um, and so she can understand her role in the world um, as someone who has to help yeah. resolve those issues. So, you know, we have all of this, so you, this means you've got to come back. Okay. So look, um, <laughs> let's, 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 let's jump into this for a second for, for, for the women, well, for everybody who's watching. We're talking about that 19-month-old baby yeah. that uh, several months ago uh, you fed from the dais in all natural. Yeah, well, I pumped. I pumped. Yeah, you, I, yeah. You, you you pumped from the desk. Yep. And um, there was some noise made about <laughs> that. <laughs> you sort of became an example. Yeah. I think though, yeah. of some of the issues that women face. Can you talk to us about that experience yeah. and what becoming that example has meant? I'm one of the moms trying to normalize breastfeeding, mm -hmm. um, which means my hope is the things I've had to do to take care of my child make it a little easier for the next mom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, nobody wants to come back from work five days after the baby is born to do their job and no one should have to. And so that part of my experience was particular to this job and not something that I m want to role model for others. But the other parts, the parts where, you know, I'm going about my day and doing what I need to to feed my baby, chairing a hearing, running long, not wanting to recess it, pumping while the hearing is, is mm -hmm. going. That and worked for me. Everybody doesn't understand pumping means feeding the baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Breastfeeding the so, baby. Right. Yeah, so, so it's, um, it's, I think of it as something I had to do to feed my baby, but mm -hmm. also hopefully something that made it easier for, say, a council staffer who now has to, mm -hmm. to take care of a child on the hectic schedule yeah. that council, um, council moves on. So it's, um, I got a lot of applause, um, I'd say, from moms mm -hmm. um, and parents in general who get that it's really hard um, to work. And, and, you know, even before I had a kid, um, worked really hard on things like paid family leave and ensuring that families have the supports they need when they have children mm -hmm. or when they adopt or honestly, you know, when you're caring for a loved one at any stage in life. Mm -hmm. But, 
Yeah, it was, um, it, it, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. I just did it, and then it became a whole phenomenon. Yeah. So, you know. So look, we have 90, by the time I finish this question, we're going to have about 90 seconds left. Okay. Lightning so round. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your, uh, you give your stump speech for those people who are in Philadelphia and all over the uh -huh. rest of the country sure. that are thinking about moving to Washington, D.C., why Ward 1 is the place for them to move. Uh, ward 1 is the most diverse ward in the District of Columbia. It's where you can come if you want culture, history, music, arts, if you want to meet people who are different than you from all different countries around the world. Um, in all different parts of the country, young, old, families, singles, really Ward 1 has everything. Um, we, we are proud of the, um, especially the uh, Latino heritage and culture um, in our community, as well as the Ethiopian heritage and culture, um, but we're a place where everyone lives, um, right all on top of each other in this very dense part of the ward. Um, beautiful parks, great schools and uh, we welcome anyone to visit or to come live. And Howard University. And one of the most prestigious universities in the country, our very own HBCU, Howard University. <laughs> we couldn't end on a better note. <laughs> Folks, that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye and may God bless. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.